Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tim Cooper, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the new GUI that will be coming in Unity 4.6. Um, we've been working on it for quite a while, and we're pretty excited to show it to you today, and I hope you learn a few things. So who am I? Uh, my name's Tim. I'm a developer at Unity. I've been with the company for almost three years now. Before this, I used to make games. Uh, the, some games I've worked on in the past are Bioshock 1 and Bioshock 2, if you've heard of them. Um, I am responsible for things like editor features and graphical features at Unity, and for the past year or so, I've been working on the GUI in terms of making it nice to use, as well as very fast at the low level and render in a very nice way. So what am I going to talk to you today about? I'm going to talk to you about some of the problems that exist with the current GUI and why we decided uh, that a new GUI would be a better solution. I'm going to talk to you about how to use the new system, and that is using our layout and canvas tools. I'm going to cover some of the basic tools we have within the system, such as buttons and text, and how you can create your own using some of the components we provide. And then I'm going to cover how the system integrates with Mechanim and the animation systems in Unity so that you can extend it in a nice way. Finally, I'm going to go through how you can use programming API to create custom controls. So what's the problem with the existing system in Unity? Well, it's really difficult to use to start with. You need to understand how to program, and it's not very artist friendly at all. Uh, when you do uh, create something with the GUI, you need to use a lot of code that you cut and paste because it's the same everywhere. And it's also not very configurable in terms of it's hard to get things to line up correctly, and it's very difficult to have things like rotated buttons and similar components. And in the end, it doesn't really look very good because it's tied very strongly to how Unity has decided you should do buttons and components. Now, we wanted to fix this with the new GUI system, and we've designed it from the ground up to be easy to use for both artists in terms of developing something beautiful and easy to use, and for programmers. And we have a very open and flexible API so that you can design and write new components if what we provide out of the box doesn't suit your game or product. So I'm going to start by talking to you about canvases. Now, think of a canvas as a painting. It is the new object we have in the GUI system that you position things on, such as text and pictures, and it renders them from back to front. So if you have a picture and then you have some text, first it will render the picture and then it will render the text. Uh, you can specify this manually in the hierarchy by reordering things, by dragging them up and down. And I'll go into that and show it to you later. A canvas exists in two modes. The first one is world space mode. And just think of that like putting a painting somewhere in your world. What it does is it renders the GUI at this position in the world, and essentially you can see it in the world as you move around, like you could uh, render computer screens or paintings or something similar using this. The second mode is screen space mode. What this does is it fills the whole screen with the canvas, and as the game view resizes or your game resizes, the canvas will resize as well. But enough talk about the canvas. Let's go and have a look at how these work in a real project. So here we have a simple game that we developed for showing off some things in the GUI. The first thing we're going to see is when we enter play mode, that there's a button in the top right that is using a GUI element, but we'll get onto that later. But we can walk around using the, the character like so. When we walk up to this spot here, you'll see a little piece of text pop up. It says, hello, career. And if you have a look at it, you may think this is just a texture that's appeared, but it's not. It's actually a canvas that exists in the world. Let's have a look at how it works. So to start with, I will select the canvas. And then we'll move to it in the world so it's easier to see. Now, as you can see, it's just something very simple. But if we expand the component, it's made of two things. To start with, there's an image. If we disable the image, you will see that uh, it goes away. You, the text is still there, even on the black screen, it's hard to see. Or we can disable the text. 
Now, these are components we provide out of the box, but for right now, we're just going to look at how the canvas works. What the canvas has is it has a rec transform. This is a new component we have for doing things in the GUI, and we'll cover it in more detail later. Right now, let's have a look at the canvas itself. On the canvas component, you have an alpha, which is how transparent the canvas is. You have an event flag, such as receive events. What this does is it allows this element to receive events from the event system. To demonstrate this, if I click on this, you will see it change state. This is because uh, there's a script that receives this event and then modifies the text that exists on the GUI, on the canvas in this case. Um, yes. If you do not specify a camera for use for the events trigger, it will just use whatever camera exists for the main camera in your game. Now, moving on, let's have a look at how a screen space camera works, a screen space GUI works. The first thing I'll do is I'll open up a new scene, which is the menu. And as you can see here, we have a nice little uh, video game title screen, which is very imaginative in the way we've named it. But if we enter play mode, you'll see that elements move and the GUI responds to input, like so, and state changes. Now, this is all really nice, because what you're seeing here is developed completely using the new GUI system. There's actually no scripts involved here, and it's, written, uh, it's all written by an artist, all, to, all done by an artist. Because the canvas we have here is in screen space mode, you'll notice something different. As we resize the game view, um, what will happen is the canvas itself will change size. Oop. Sorry. So as you can see, the canvas is growing and shrinking in the scene view as the game view changes. This allows you to have a UI that's designed in such a way as to scale onto many different types of hardware. If we enter one of the worlds that we've got for this video game, and this is the same world as you saw before, you'll notice that not only is there this canvas in the world here, there's also a screen space canvas, and that's what's responding to the events here. Using the new GUI system, it's possible to have as many types of canvases as you want and overlay them in a very user-defined way. And this allows you to create complex GUI hierarchies that respond to different forms of user input as well as uh, responding to different animations as well. It's all quite nice when you get down to it. Now, let's move on and have a look at the Rec Transform component I mentioned before. Now, the Rec Transform component is a new component that we've added in Unity 4.6. It is used to lay out elements inside of a canvas. Rec Transforms provide many modes, such as absolute positioning, relative positioning, and by this I mean you can position elements relative to their parent, and auto-scaling and resizing. That is, if you have a relative positioned object and then scale the parent, you can also scale the child by the same amount. Now, these rec transforms are manipulated in the scene using the new rect tool. So let's have a quick look in this about how that works. What we will do is we'll just quickly select the background here. If you've used Unity 2D, you're probably familiar with these controls where you have the ability to scale or rotate or like so. Now, using this, these tools, it's possible to rotate things like buttons and input fields, and these fields will still respond correctly to input, just, as how, just how you would expect a rotated button to behave. Uh, one further thing to note before I move on is that rec transforms work in different ways depending on if you're on a world space canvas or a screen space canvas. Looking here, you will see that for the rec transform of this screen space canvas, it says that the values are driven. What this means is that they're not controlled by this rec transform. As I move the scene view up and down, you will see that in the, the properties for the rec transform, the position and the height change. 
What, this is what happens with screen space canvases, as they are always controlled by the resolution that the, the, your project is running at. So let's have a look at how this works in more detail. For a canvas that's in screen space mode, the width and height will always be the screen resolution. If the canvas is in world space mode, you manually specify the width and height. And what this means is you specify how many pixels wide and how many pixels high you want the canvas to be. Because in the GUI system as it currently stands, one world unit maps to one pixel. With the GUI system, you'll also notice that by using the Rect Transform tool, it doesn't modify the scale of the object. What it modifies is it modifies the width and the height. Let's open another scene and explore this a bit further. So the first thing we have here is we have a scene which has a menu. This is a very simple GUI, and if we enter play mode, you'll see that it responds to some animation and that kind of thing. It's quite nice. But that's not what's interesting right now. What we want to look at is we want to look at this GUI's rec transform. Unlike the one we saw earlier, this GUI is a world space GUI. What this means is that it exists in the world like a painting. It has a width and it has a height. And by using the rec transform tool, it modifies the width and the height directly. If you've used 2D, you'd be not, you, uh, you're probably familiar with these kind of tools. But in Unity 4.6, the rec tool and similar are now first party citizens within Unity. If you have a look at the toolbar at the top, you will see that in addition to the pan, move, rotate, and scale tool, there is now a rec transform tool. What this does is it allows uh, any kind of 2D project to work in a nice way. Uh, and internally, it has, has allowed us to simplify and combine the code. So it's the 2D system and the GUI system feel like you're using the same tools. Let's have a look at how a rec transform works within another rec transform. And by that I mean, what happens when you put a button inside a, a window or a component? Here we have a simple button. If you look at the screen here, you'll see that it has a position of x and y of 0, and it has a width and height. This button is in absolute space. This means that as I move the button around, you'll notice that the position will change, but the width and height will remain the same. Also, if I select the parent rec transform and scale it, the button will not resize. It will just maintain its position in an absolute space relative to its parent. There are other modes that you can do, though. So let's make this button, instead of being in absolute size, let's make it scale relative to its parent. If you look here in the middle, you'll see that there is a yellow clover. By clicking on this clover and moving it, it changes how the relative positioning works. So what you can do is you can say, anchor this button to the bottom right of the screen. And that is, as the window resizes, its position will be relative to the bottom right rather than the top left. So if I scale like this, you'll see. But there are other things you can do as well, such as doing uh, horizontal stretching or vertical stretching. Let's just uh, revert to thing how things were before and have a look at this clover. One interesting thing you can do is you can actually select one of the leaves of the clover and drag it to the side. You can do the same on the other side. And by doing this, what you've defined is you've defined a scalable component. What it will try and do is it will try and maintain the padding on both the left and the right side, and the button in the middle will resize relative to that. So if I do some scaling like this, you'll see that now the button resizes. When the button is configured this way, you'll notice that in the inspector, we don't have a position x and a width anymore. What we have is we have a left and a right. What these specify is the amount of pixel padding. So let's modify this slightly and change the left padding to 50 and the right padding to 50. What will happen now is the side padding on the left and the right will maintain itself at 50 pixels. 
So as we resize the parent, which is in this case the window, you will see that it behaves in a nice manner. This allows you to design GUIs that work on a variety of hardware devices and scale accordingly to those devices. Moving on into a bit more detail about how the rect transform works, you'll notice that there's a tool here. What this does is when you click it, you'll see a little pop-up. This provides a number of simple yet common defaults for how you wish to align things. You can align them manually, like I showed before in the viewport itself, but for the most part, I find myself using these options more than anything else. So you can do things such as align to the top left, align to the center, align to the bottom left. But there's also things such as scaling built into this. So if I were to, say, just select the scaling option here, it would add the clovers and the padding in exactly how they were before. So using these options can be quite handy. One other thing to note is by pressing Shift or by pressing Alt on the keyboard, you can modify the behavior slightly. By pressing Alt, it will actually move the object, or you can also set it to do scaling as well and stretch to the maximum constraints. Let's have a quick look at how you could lay out two buttons next to each other in a nice way. So the first thing I'll do is I'll duplicate our original button. Uh, I'll actually resize it first. I'll give it a width of 200. And then I will duplicate it. Now the first thing I'll do is I'll put the first button onto the left. And I'll put the second button onto the right. Let's just manually move these in a little bit so they look a little bit nicer. We can do this by modifying the position offset, and we'll make it 150. And on this one, we can actually use a value of negative 150 as values are relative to their anchoring position. So now we have two, two buttons laid out next to each other that look quite nice. But what happens if we're to resize the view? What you'll see happen is that the buttons overlap and don't look very nice. So what we need to do is make these buttons resize in a nice way relative to their parents. The first thing we'll do is we'll select the button. And instead of using the current mode, which is absolute size, we'll drag the clover so that it is aligned with the right. And we'll then, on the second button, grab the clover so that it is aligned with the left. If we now enter play mode, oh, we don't need to do this, sorry. If we just, uh, now we resize it, you'll see that the buttons resize. But it's still not very nice. And the reason for this is that the, the offsets are relative to the edge of the screen rather than to the edge of the button. So, and we want to preserve the space between them. So what we do is instead of setting the clover to the far right-hand side, we set it to the middle. And then on the other button, we do the same. What this will do is it will make sure that the gap between them maintains its size and the buttons resize in a nice way, like so. Now, there are a lot of things you can do with this system, and there are a lot more advanced things you can do. But as an overview, this shows you just how powerful the system can be if you wish to have a GUI that scales in a nice way, depending on what hardware you're using. So let's have a look at a few more components we provide out of the box that you can use. Um, one of the first ones is a set of auto layout components. I'm not going to go into much detail with these. I'm just going to show you that they exist and how they work. So I will open up a scene which demonstrates this. So here we have a simple scene that has a keyboard that you can enter data on. If we were to resize this, you'll notice that the elements move up and down to fit in a nice way. This is using a new control we have in the GUI system, which is called the layout control. Here we are. And here we have a vertical layout group. And what this does is it automatically lays out whichever elements are inside it. I'm not going to go into too much information on how this works just yet, because we're still refining the workflows before we release it, and they're prone to change. Um, out of the box, we hope to have a layout mode such as grid, 
horizontal flow and vertical flow. Uh, this will, should allow you to write uh, scalable GUIs based on external content without needing to manually position things. So now we've covered how the base layout systems will work with a new GUI. Let's talk about the controls. Um, we've designed our controls to conceptually fall into two categories, uh, drawing controls and interaction controls. Now, what are drawing controls used for? As the name implies, they're used for things that render to the screen. In a drawing control, you do things such as calculate the vertices and their positions, what texture coordinates to use, the colors, as well as set things like material and texture data. Things like text and images are drawing controls. Let's have a look at creating a drawing control and then go through two of the ones we have inbuilt into Unity 4.6. So I'm going to start by creating a new scene. And then from the game object menu, you'll notice that there's a new option, which is create UI. This is where we are putting all of the components which are related to the user interface such as buttons, panels, images, sliders, and, and the like. But for now, we're just going to create a simple component, which is an image component. Now, the image component is one of the base building blocks of the new GUI. And what it does is it renders sprites uh, to the screen, but with, a different, well, with many ways of configuring them. So I've now created the image. Um, because there was no canvas in the scene to begin with, the system automatically created one for us and added the image as a, as a child. Now, if we have a look here in the image component, you'll see there are a number of things, such as source image, color, material, and image type. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to just select an image for this. We're going to use the same cube that you saw earlier. When you're in simple mode, you'll notice that as we resize the image, it stretches and squishes it. This is because in simple mode, it just tries to make what image you have uh, fit the square as best it can. One thing we can do after this, though, is modify the mode to, to be preserve aspect ratio. This will ensure that the width and height of the image are always the width and height, or the, the aspect ratio of the width and height from the original image. But enough with this square. Let's start looking at some of the more advanced modes we support. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just uh, use this panel here and create a, a button-looking thing. Uh, we'll switch it back to simple mode just so I can demonstrate something to you. When we have something like this that stretches and scales and can resize depending on its internal content, one thing you'll notice is you probably don't want the edges to scale and stretch. So if we make this very thin, you'll see the edges get compressed. Or if we make this very large, you'll see in the game view that they get very large. This isn't really desirable. Uh, what we want is we want the edges to maintain a nice uniform side, size, but the internals of this component to scale. So what we'll do is we'll change to a new mode we have called Sliced. If we resize this now, you'll see that the edges maintain their correct size, and the middle gets stretched. This allows this component to scale to many different uh, user interface sizes without looking bad or incorrect. To generate a sprite that is capable of being used for slicing, we've improved the sprite editor in 4.5, or 4.6, sorry. If you open up a sprite edit, the sprite editor, you'll see that there are now these lines. What these can do is they can slice the sprite into nine positions. In the top left, top right, bottom left, and bottom right, what happens is uh, the sprite will always render with, in a pixel-perfect way. That is, however many pixels here will always be that many pixels in the screen. The top and the bottom will stretch uh, horizontally, and the middle parts on the left and right will stretch vertically. This means that you can end up with a sprite that will scale nicely. If you're not familiar with nine slicing, you should have a, do some research about it, because it's a very common technique used for GUIs, and it's something we're pushing quite hard within the new system. OK. So now we have our, our simple image. Let's have a look at some of the other options. One thing you can do is you can modify the color. This will apply a color tint to the button. 
You can also change the material if you wish to do more complex effects, but we're not going to do that for this example, and change the image mode, as I've shown already. Let's look at the next component we have. So the next graphic building block component we have is text. Now, if you're making a user interface, it's probably very common that you wish to have text in the interface. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to select the text and make it a child of the image. Then we're going to resize the rect transform to match the size of the parent. As you can see, the text is, has now moved to the top left. But that's OK, because we can modify this. If you have a look in the settings for the text, we have paragraph layout options, such as horizontal and vertical alignment. And for now, we just make them be in the center. Let's change the text to say something a bit more exciting, like so. And as you can see, it's updated in the game view in a nice way. You can also do things like modify the size and many other types of things you'd expect from text. Uh, one thing I'm not quite happy about right now is I'm not sure I like this font. So let's just change it to be something a bit nicer. As with uh, most text in Unity, it's possible to use rich text markup to modify the color and the size of characters in line. So what we're going to do is we're going to modify the color of one of these words to be blue. There we are. As simple as marking it up in the source string. If you modify the color of a text component, what you'll see happen is the default text color changes, but anything you've marked up will remain the same as the markup. In addition to this, we provide a few simple effects for the text. Um, after the first release, we intend to expand this. But for 4.6, we have two modes. That is drop shadow and outline. If we have a look at this text closely and add an effect like so, you can see that by modifying the color, you can add effects like shadowing and the like to your components. Now, what I've shown is how you can create some simple graphical controls. Uh, the API for this is completely open. And if you wish to create your own types of drawing controls, you can easily do it using the API. But let's move on to looking at how interaction works within the system. Now, the new GUI uh, features a new event system. What this does is it sends events to GUI elements based on input and mouse and cursor state. The interaction controls that we've written in the system respond to these events. Some events they handle are things like pointer down, pointer up, click, hover, drag. But I'm not going to cover them in a lot of detail right now. They're all documented in the APIs for when the software is released. So normally a behavior control will do something such as uh, when you click a button, you may want an event to trigger, or you may just simply want to modify what the graphic looks like. So what we're going to do is we're going to expand our little example we made before to actually be a button. Now, you can write your own code to do this if you feel like it. But what we've got in the framework we provide is we have a button component that you can attach to anything within the GUI system. So we have a button now. It consists of an image and some text. But what we're going to add is we're going to add a button component. But before we do that, I'll just quickly show you that within the framework we provide, we actually have a default button. Oops, I created a panel instead. Yep. Now, the default button we provide is essentially going to be the Unity default button. And if we enter play mode, you'll see that it just responds as you would expect a button to. But Let's not use the one that we provide, and let's build one from scratch. So the first thing we'll do is we'll just rename our base image to button, because that's what it will be from now on. And we'll add a component for this. It's simply called the button component. And by default, when you add this, it should behave as you would expect a button to. If you, now if you mouse over, the state of the image changes, as well as it responds to other events. If we go into and have a look at this button script, what you'll see is that there's a few different transition modes. 
such as color tint, sprite swap, and animation, which we'll go into in a little bit further. And what happens is, for each state the button supports, we do something. Um, so when we go into normal mode, what happens is we leave the color white. If we go into a highlight mode, we use yellow as a highlight color. And if we press, we use brown. Now, it's possible for you to write your own modes and extend this if you feel like it. But out of the box, these are the modes we're going to provide. Now, as you saw, that does a nice color tint. But it's, uh, it's not very advanced. Let's have a look at something like Sprite Swap. Now, Sprite Swap is a little bit different. But as the name implies, when you enter a state, it will swap the sprite that's displayed. So what I've done is I've configured a sprite swap so that when we enter the hover state, the background will change, just like so. But we don't really have a set of images to do this, so let's just leave it a color tint for the moment. Now, moving on from how to color and uh, transition your button component, there's something that's very important. If you're making a game for a console, or for a keyboard input, you need to be able to manage selection state without using a mouse. One thing we have and provide with this system is a set of tools to uh, define and uh, configure navigation. So what I've done is I've simply duplicated the button. And when we enter play mode, what we'll do is we'll start by just selecting one of the elements. Um, you can configure the event system to do this automatically. But for this example, we haven't done that. But now, if I use the keyboard to press up and down, you'll see that the selection state changes. Now, this is handled by navigation. There are a few modes of navigation we provide out of the box. The first one is automatic. What this does is it simply tries to find the most logical thing on a button press to move. But there are situations where this isn't quite what you want. So some of the other modes we provide are horizontal, which allows only left and right input, vertical, which allows only up and down input, and explicit. In explicit mode, you can manually specify the things you wish to select when an input event occurs. The final mode is none, which means that this uh, control will not allow you to do any selection uh, on button press. Let's just leave this at automatic for the time being. So now you've seen how you can create a button uh, using the inbuilt controls we have. And by doing this, uh, and we did this by using a set of images and a set of text and a set of interaction controls. Now, most controls we have in the system follow a similar pattern. We use images for display, yet we use interaction controls to control what is rendered and the things that uh, the, the events that get triggered from these things, such as a button press. Now, let's talk about animation. One thing we really wanted to do with the system was provide an integration with Mechanim so that you can do much more than the standard events uh, like color tint and sprite swap. So in this GUI system, what can be animated? Basically anything. Uh, things like panels, buttons, button state, um, anything you define in your own custom scripts, you can animate them using Mechanim, and they should just work. So let's have a quick look at a scene where we do this. So we have a game seen here, a little GUI demo, a mock-up of what you might expect in a real video game. And when we enter play mode, what you'll see is the GUI slides out. If we have a look at the, the element, it just has standard animation as you would normally do and have probably used within Unity before. It's just keyframe animation that modifies values in the rec transform. This isn't too exciting, but it shows that it's possible. What is a little bit more exciting is as we mouse over these controls inside and click and do similar things, what you'll notice is that we're also using the animation system for this, and we're using Mechanim. If we expand the GUI and have a look at a button, you'll see that this button is in animation mode. What this does is it means that you have an animation controller that responds to triggers that are sent. Uh, the types of triggers we have are the same as for sprite swap and color tint, yet you can define what string is sent to the event system. Oh, sorry, sent to mechanism. We have normal, highlight, press, and disabled in this example. And we also provide this nice little button here for auto-generate animation, 
What this means is if you turn into animation mode and don't have a configured animator and animation controller, by clicking this, we will automatically create everything for you in a nice template that you can then go and modify. Now that we know this has an animator and is using Mechanim, let's go and have a closer look at the state diagram. What you see here is we have a selected button, and it's just sitting there in the normal state because no trigger has been sent. As we highlight the button, you'll see that the state mod get changes to the highlighted state, and when we press button, you'll see that we modify it to the press state. This is a very simple example we have here, and you could elaborate on this state diagram and do a many large number of things, like have different blend trees, different substate diagrams, and similar. So it's quite powerful in that regard. Let's modify this button to do something a little bit different in the highlighted state. So the first thing we'll do is we'll select the button, and we'll change the animation view to be in the highlighted state, which it already was. As this is just a script, and, and everything in the GUI is also animatable, what we can do is we can select the background. We can then select the image component of the background game object and select the sprite. What happens is it inserts two keyframes for us. We'll just remove the first for the moment, where you can specify what sprite is being used. If, we, if you look at the inspector, you'll see that now we have the source image as the field being animated. And what we can do is we can change it to be the speech bubble. If you look here, you'll see that it has now appeared, and we can now exit animation mode. Now, all these buttons respond to the highlighted event and trigger this uh, new curve we have added, and you can see the sprite swap occurring. Um, by using animation, it's possible to do many, many advanced uh, types of functionality uh, within your GUI. You can have things move in and out of the screen. You can have buttons uh, grow larger and smaller and work correctly with the event system. Or you can just do simple things like hover with sprite swap and color swap. So it's quite powerful and quite useful. If you're curious as to why all the buttons were, had, the, um, had the same image when they were being hovered, it's because they shared uh, the same animation controller and would modify the animation to do that. So it also shows that this works very nicely with the prefab system. So you could create a bunch of buttons that then remap nicely when you change an image. So let's have a quick talk about custom components before we finish. So everything you've seen here today in terms of the controls we've been using have been developed using our open and easy to use API. Um, we use the same tools you do when creating your components. And one of the things we really wanted was to have nothing internal or secret that we could use that you couldn't. So by developing these controls, we've basically tested that the APIs we provide are open enough for you to use and because we use the same. Um, the controls we have out of the box are relatively standard GUI controls, but we understand that a lot of games require very specific and very custom GUI systems. Now, because of this, we, have allow, we allow you to write your own. So let's go through a quick example of how you can write a GUI control very quickly. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a drag and drop controller. I'll just quickly show you how this works, just so you can see it before we go through the code. So what we have here is we just have a screen space GUI with two character faces in the left and one in the middle. What you can do is when you click on one of these, you see a little icon appear. Then you can drag it to here and let go, and it'll swap. Now, this is all done in user project code with nothing special, but let's have a look at how you would do this. So the first thing we want to do is when we click on the, the, the smile face on the left, we wish to create an icon. The event system sends an event called on pointer down. We can use this event to generate this item. When we move the, the mouse or the cursor, we also want to move the icon. The event system sends a nice event to us called pointer drag. We can use this event to modify where the icon is located on the screen. And when we release the mouse, we want to handle the drop. Now, to do this, there's two steps, and one of them didn't quite fit on the slide, so I'll just go through the first one verbally. Um, when we let go of the mouse, we want to handle the pointer drop and destroy the icon. We also want to respond to the on drop event, and this is, where, this is the item that you drop the smiley face on. So let's have a look at how we did this in code. So the first script we have is a script called drag me. 
What this does is it responds to the original events that I talked about and does handling. So the first thing you see is we have on pointer down. What this does is quite simply, it, it creates an icon, it positions it in the correct space in the GUI hierarchy, and then sets its position. What it, and yeah, it sets the icon by just modifying the sprite value. The drag controller simply changes the position of the icon as you drag, and when you let go, we simply destroy the icon. So that means that if I was to move this and then let go, you would see the icon disappears as you'd expect. The second part of this is handling the drop. That is, when you drag the, the icon over and let go, this object here has to handle the drop event. So we have a little script on that object called drop me, and it's actually quite simple. All we do is we implement the on drop event, and we just read the value that was dragged and then swap, swap the sprite on this item. It's that simple. And the API rebuilds everything nicely for you. Um, all the controls we provide are built using this same uh, architecture. And as we find needs for new events to be sent by the event system, we add them in. Um, right now, we provide a large set of events. Um, and it probably won't grow. Or we might add one or two before we release. But Right now, we find it's adequate for everything we need. And we'll be happy to hear from you after you start using the system if there's something that you want to do that the event system doesn't provide, and then we'll most likely add it in for you. Uh, one other thing to just quickly note is the event system works on an interface level. So by implementing the interface, you'll just receive the events so long as you have an event system configured correctly. So uh, that's it for the quick tour of the GUI. Um, I've gone through things like the layout controls, uh, making your own components using composition, as well as how to script your own controls if you're trying to do something more advanced. Um, we look forward to you having a play with this system, and we look forward to your feedback on the first version when we release Unity 4.6. And thank you for your time. Um, I should ask, are there any questions? Uh, yes. 안녕하세요. 어, 저 굉장히 훌륭한 GUI 시스템인 것 같은데요. 어, 지금 예제로 나온 것들은 다 키보드의 그 마우스나 키보드에 대한 그 이벤트인 것 같은데 그 터치 음. 이벤트들에 대해서는 제가 예제를 앞에서 못본것 같아서 그 부분들은 어떻게 되는지 좀 궁금합니다. Okay, uh, so the way we've designed the system is that it's, uh, it's agnostic in terms of uh, touch events and mouse events. So if you saw the API, which I'll just quickly bring up again for you, is we have a concept of a pointer, not a mouse or a cursor. So a pointer in our system is a touch or a, uh, a mouse pointer event. Um, what does differ, though, is that the event system sends slightly different de events depending on if you're a touch device or you're on a, or a PC device with a mouse cursor. So by, by uh, using the, the pointer down and pointer up handlers, you will receive events from a touch device as you would expect to receive them. Uh, yep, next question. Uh, I don't really mind who, so anyone, anyone is fine. <laughs> yeah, 안녕하세요. 저기 음, 보통 개발자 컨퍼런스 어, 커뮤니티를 가 보면 어, 현재 유니티에서 기본적으로 제공하는 UI 시스템이 그 퍼포먼스적으로 약간 문제가 많다고 얘기를 들었는데 혹시 이번에 적용되는 시스템이 <웃음> 퍼포먼스적으로 어세스토어에 제공되는 것들보다 얼마나 더 개선이 되는지 알고 싶습니다. Mm. Yep. Uh, so the new system is uh, written from the ground up to be very fast and very performant. Um, 
we have a concept of uh, the GUI controls that you saw. Uh, they only ever get recalculated or, and reconfigured if something changes. We also integrate with the um, Atlas system that exists in Unity 2D, so that when you build a GUI, if you're using sprites, we will pack all of the sprites uh, that the GUI uses uh, into the same sprite sheet if possible. And what this allows is it allows us to do uh, much better batching when we render so that the draw call count is lowered. Um, you can still make a slow GUI, for example, if you're trying to do lots of complex effects and use different materials. Um, so what we do is we batch based on uh, material and texture, essentially. So if you use the same material and you sprite atlasing, then you'll probably get good performance with the system. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, 일단 보고 굉장히 멋지다고 생각해서 감사의 말씀을 좀 전해드리고 싶고요. Thank you. 아, 저는 세 가지 정도 질문을 하고 싶은데요. Mm-hmm. 첫 번째는 지금 예시로 버튼을 주로 보여주셨는데 어, 리스트나 뭐 콤보 박스나 체크 박스 같은 걸 주로 게임 만들 때 많이 쓰거든요. 그런 것도 기본으로 제공이 되는지 궁금하고요. 어, 두 번째는 유니티가 이제 무료와 유료 이런 식으로 구분돼서 제공이 되는데 어, 새로운 유, 이 GUI 시스템을 쓸때그 무료 사용하시는 분들한테 어떤 제한이 있는지 좀 궁금하고요. 어, 세 번째는 이거 빨리 좀 써보고 싶은데 대략적으로 언제쯤 이게 <웃음> 출시가 될지 궁금합니다. <웃음> 예. Yeah, I'll answer your uh, last question first, and that is, uh, we hope to get this into your hands as soon as possible. Right now, we are finalizing a few things and finishing off a few components. Um, I can't say what the exact release date will be, but we're entering the final phases of development and doing a lot of polish and bug fixing work at the moment. Um, the first question is, currently the default list of um, items we provide, are the panel, the button, text, image, a few different other types, such as sliders, toggles. Uh, selection list is a list that when you click on, it pops up a larger list to select from, it's like, so like a drop down. Um, we also have uh, things like the, the layout components, like the grid layout and the flow layouts, but they're not currently in the list. And we will be adding a uh, scroll view, so for using for nice use on touch devices. Um, these are the ones, the ones in the list here are the ones that are mostly complete. Um, the, the ones that aren't in the list, we have decided, we don't think they're a good enough quality yet to add to the list. So, uh, and also, after we release the first version of the software, we will continue to add new default components as it makes sense. The thing we've really been concentrating on is trying to get the system right from the, at, at the core level so that we can use it for a long time in the future and develop more components and allow you to do the same. And uh, could I please have a repeat of the second question because I forgot what it was. Uh, good. 유니티가 유료와 무료로 제공이 되는 방법이 있는데 아, 예. 아, 예. Yeah. Um, so currently the GUI system is definitely available for free and it will be available in Unity free. Uh, we, all the features that I've shown today are in Unity free. Um, we haven't decided if we're going to have any pro features in the first release. Uh, we may do at a later stage, but right now we, we probably won't, but I should not be held to that because it may change before release. But you will be able to definitely make GUIs in Unity free. Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah. 간단한 질문 하나인데요. 그 캔버스 쪽에 이제 그 그러니까 다른 UI에 비교해서 이제 그 소팅 오더 그 하는 부분이 다른 UI에 대해서 흔히 뎁스라고 하는 부분이 현재 UI 시스템에서 좀 빠져 있는 것 같아서 그분에 대, 대해서 설명을 좀 부탁드리겠습니다. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the way the sorting order works for our system is it's based off the order specified within the hierarchy. So let's say I just quickly modify this scene a tiny bit. 
and make it so that one of these images is overlapping the other one. What you'll see is the order is specified as being the sad face and the happy face. If I was to move this to be below instead, it would render in the other order. Now, this is both uh, this is nice for users who are using it within the uh, the interface, but this is also exposed via API, so you can have elements moving back and forward by just modifying these values. Uh, by, yeah, by modifying it via API. Um, we do have a concept of depth, but it's not used for draw order. The depth is used for things like uh, perspective transformation. So it's, it's a simply just a, a visibility thing when you're using a 3D GUI or a world space GUI. Thank you. I think there was a question down here. Ah, 보통 그 UI에 들어가는 이미지들을 모아놓는 어 아틀라스라는 것들을 보통 있게 되는데 어 그것들을 관리하거나 또는 최적화하는 툴 같은 것들이야 되는 지원이 있는지 궁금합니다. So, if you're familiar with the Unity 2D, what we provide is the sprite editor we have allows you to import atlases and do sprite slicing and things like that. If you want to know more about that, there's a man around called uh, Vili, and he wrote the system and can probably give you much more information than I can. Um, but what we do is, when we build a GUI, what we do is we look at what sprites are being used that you've imported, and then we pack them into one atlas. Um, if you are talking about using other forms of sprite middleware that don't have especially a sprite sheet, um, what you can do is you can extend existing components within the system, and instead of having an image like we have here that just takes one of our sprites, you could have, say, a uh, My Magic image that has this, the sprite element for you and that does your specific code that you want. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's just one more over there. Aka ku sorting order na uh depth set taran de ku hierarchy de de taraso bakkindaden go temne sengin chilmun indeyo. Uh animation dojunge 그 컴포넌트 간의 순서를 바꾸려면은 그러면 구현이 불가능할 것 같은데 어떤 방법이 있을지 좀 물어보고 싶습니다. Um, yeah, uh, so currently Unity animation system, as far as I'm aware, um, doesn't support reordering of things in the transform hierarchy um, during animation. This is something that I think will be a limitation for the first release. But we will probably change that at a later date when we have uh, time to work more closely with the animation team to do, do these kind of changes. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, 이미지 같은 경우 일부분을 이렇게 투명화하는 작업이 어, 되게 어렵습니다. 그래서 이번에 GUI 같은 경우는 어, 이미지의 일부분을 투명화 가, 하, 처리 같은 거 하는 것이 좀 쉬워졌는지 어, 그것이 가능한지 궁금합니다. Uh, yes, so the GUI, um, all images you have, they will use the alpha channel for transparency. But in addition to that, uh, you can do things like modify the alpha of a canvas using this slider. And you can also just, on the image itself, select the color and then modify the alpha, alpha there. So via the UI, it's quite easy to set up how things render in alpha way. If you want to do special forms of blending, you can also write custom shaders to do that. Out of the box, we just do standard blending because that's what we find most useful for all the GUI components we provide. But it's open enough for you to configure it how you wish. Uh, um, 
Well, so when we render the image, it's done in the shader, and it just uses um, standard um, alpha blending within the shader. So you would need to modify the source image to have the transparency where you desire it to be. Um, we haven't heard a use case for what you're describing before, but if you can provide one, I'd really like to hear it just to see what you're trying to do and if that is the best way or if we can find a better way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that's all we have time for. So thank you very much.